Mark's writing changes dramatically, right? The whole tone of the story changes from this moment on. Right? The theme of Mark 14, which is by far the longest chapter in the book, the theme is the abandonment of Jesus. Right? Starting this morning, one by one, everyone is going to abandon Jesus. And so finally, God himself abandons Jesus. And he is left utterly alone, um, as no one has ever been alone before, uh, naked on the cross. But we're not there yet. We're going we're to trace that abandonment step by step. And remember, this is the most important week in the life of the most important man who has ever lived. Right? These, these events were recorded for us to teach us and to warn us. Right? And that's what we can have um, here this morning. We have two very different examples of how you can respond to Jesus. And I want to contrast those two examples this morning in terms of worth. Right? We're, we're going to talk about value this morning. Whether you are consciously aware of it or not, you are always automatically assessing the value of things. Right? You do it with money, you do it with time, you do it with relationships, with everything. We are all value analysts. And let me explain to you what I mean. You pursue what you deem valuable. Right? You spend your time, your money, and other resources on whatever it is that you have decided is most valuable or important. So, for example, as part of a family of six that was raised on a pastor's salary, I was instilled with a strong sense of, of frugality. Right? I am very economical um, when it comes um, to money, or as Melissa would put it, I'm cheap, uh, is what, <laughs> what she says. Um, I don't like spending money. I'm just being completely honest with you. I don't, I don't like doing it. We were never allowed to drink soda um, at a restaurant, so now we only ever have water. Because that's just that's that's how I was raised. Uh, I, I don't like spending money on clothes. Right? This suit, forty bucks. I'm being completely honest with you. Right? From a warehouse. That's, where I, that, that's how I roll. Right? I don't like spending money on expensive clothes. I, I hate spending money on um, on fancy expensive meals. It, it's wasted on me. I I'm stressed. Right? At expensive meals. I'm thinking the whole time like. How many double cheeseburgers can I get at McDonald's for the price of this one meal? Right? That's, that's how I think about things, right? Um, but I, I'm going to be completely honest with you, as Melissa pointed out early on in our relationship, I am inconsistent with my cheapness, right? So I don't like expensive food, I don't like clothes, so I don't subscribe much work for them, so I don't spend money on them. But I spend lots of money on books. Right? It's a problem. The UPS man hates me, right? Because he's always having to come to our house with more books. Now, I buy books partly because I need to. It's part of my job to read and to learn and to prepare um, for these sermons. But mostly, I, I buy books because I love books, right? They are, they are of great worth to me, so I am willing to invest my money and spend my time reading those books. Right? We all, likewise, invest in what we value. Right? If you really love and care about something, you will spend your money and your time on that something. Right? For you, maybe shoes, or maybe clothes, or a car, or your family, or music, or food, or, or vacations, or, or whatever it is for you, if you value it, right, you will work to get it. Worth. Right? And it is this concept that is at the very heart of worship. Right? It's worth Ship, right? That's actually what the word means. Worship is not just singing songs on a Sunday morning. No, worship is ascribing ultimate value to something. Right? It is declaring what you think is the most valuable and then using everything that you are and everything that you have to do that. That's what worship is. And worship is not a Christian thing. Right? Worship is not something that just Christians do. Everyone worships something. Everyone worships what they consider to be the most valuable thing to them. So I want you to be thinking as we begin to work through this text, right? What is the most important, what is the most valuable thing in the world to you? And don't just say Jesus because you know you're supposed to say Jesus, right? Be completely honest with yourself. What do you most highly value? Right? Because in our passage, we're going to meet two people who both have very intimate knowledge of a relationship with Jesus. But each of them respond completely differently to him because of what is most valuable to them. We're going to look at Mary as an example of the right response 
to Jesus, and then Judas, obviously, as an example of the wrong response to Jesus. And I want to see how these two individuals represent ultimately the two type of people in this room this morning. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, every one of us is either Mary or we are Judas. Right? And it all depends on what we most value. Right? We're going to look at Jesus Christ and the value, his infinite of value, I think, and see how these two people respond to that. All right, so go ahead and look down at your copy of the Word, uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Follow along as I read. This is God's Word. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Let's, let's pray um, for our time. Father, I ask that you would show us the infinite value of Jesus Christ. Father, nothing that I can say can convince anyone um, of his value. Father, I pray that your spirit would work and convince my heart and the heart of everyone in here uh, that he is worth it and that he is valued. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, so our passage, it, just, it opens on a very ominous note. Right? The, the religious leaders are determined to kill Jesus. They're, they're just trying to figure out how to do it. it it's the Passover, and in the Passover you have tens of thousands of pilgrims coming into and flooding the city. And they don't want to risk um, causing a, a riot or making a scene. So they, they, they seek a solution um, that will be stealthy. And Judas is the one who will come and provide that solution eight verses later. And so our passage this morning is another example of what we've seen a few times. Mark does this a lot. We're going to say Mark and Sandwich. Right? He, he starts one story, he pauses, interrupts it with the second story, and then he comes back at the end and finishes the first story. That's, that's what happens here. And Mark does this for the purpose of comparing and contrasting the two stories. He's trying to tie them together and draw our attention to the relationship between the two. So he starts off with the plot to kill Jesus. But again, we know that this is, this is not some new plot. Right? They've been working on this from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. All the way back in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, right when he began, the Pharisees, it says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. They're going to kill Jesus. They just don't know how yet. Um, but before they figure out how, Mark shifts scenes to tell us about Mary. Except, for some reason, Mark doesn't tell us that it's Mary. Right? Again, it's a little confusing. There's, there's a lot of Marys. All right? This is not Jesus' mother, Mary. Um, this is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And this is also not Mary Magdalene. Right? It's a different Mary. She was also, she was not a prostitute. Um, she also was not married um, to Jesus either. Um, and there's, there's so many different Marys and there's so many different anointings that it can get a little bit confusing sometimes. Right? Our passage, this same story is recorded in Matthew 26 and John chapter 12. Right? Same story. But there is another famous anointing which is similar but is very different as well in Luke chapter 7. Remember Luke 7, Jesus is dying at the house of a Pharisee and a sinful woman comes in and anoints his feet, uh, wets him with her tears and wipes him with her hair. That's a completely different story. That is not what is going on here. Right? Don't confuse the two stories. Mark tells us that in our story, Jesus is at Bethany. Remember, right outside of Jerusalem, there's a town of Bethany. That's where Jesus is standing and traveling back and forth. And it says he's at the house of a man named Simon the Leper. We have no idea who he 
is. But we can safely assume that he was Simon the former leper. Right? People did not go over and hang out at lepers' houses for dinner. Hey, maybe you want to come for dinner? Uh, thanks. <laughs> You're a leper. I'm not. No, so we think he had to be someone who had been healed um, by Jesus, who is now a follower and supporter of Jesus. And Mark doesn't really give us much more information than that, but John actually does in John chapter 12. In John 12, this story comes right after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is at the dinner that this is happening. Martha is there. She's the one kind of serving um, the meal. And John says that they're giving this meal in honor of Jesus for what he did for Lazarus. It's like celebration of the resurrection of, of Lazarus. And it was in the middle of that dinner that Martha's sister Mary enters. And why Mark doesn't tell us that's Mary, we don't know. Mark often doesn't use names, but, but John does. And so back to Mark, he tells us that Jesus is, they're eating. He's reclining at table. Right? They ate differently um, often back then than we do. Right? We sit at our tables and we sit up and eat and talk. And, no, they had these low tables on the floor with kind of these almost beds and pillows where they, they laid down, they reclined on the floor with their legs kind of out behind them. They pop up on one hand and they eat um, with, with the other hand. And that, that, that's how they ate back then. And this is the situation that Mary enters into, which, by the way, wouldn't have been allowed. Right? Women were not allowed to come into these meals unless they were serving the food. But she doesn't care. And she comes in anyways with this alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. We, we found a bunch of these things. They're just kind of these tiny little perfume bottles. They're not boxes. They're, they're these little bottles of perfume. And alabaster is just kind of this marble, white marble type of material. They're these stone, little expensive bases. And it says it's filled with this nard. And nard is this kind of, this oil, uh, this aromatic oil that comes from the root that was grown all the way out in India. Right? It was very rare, and it was very, very expensive, and they used it for perfume. But since it was so pricey, and it was so effective, a little bit went a long way. Right? Like one little drop was all one woman would use for her perfume. These bottles would last for years and years and years. But Mary uses far more than a drop. She breaks the flask. She pours the whole thing over Jesus' head. John tells us that she anoints his feet as well. The whole bottle is wasted. On Jesus. And again, this isn't some knockoff brand of perfume you can buy out of a school street or something. This is really expensive stuff. Verse 5 tells us that the, the, the anointment was worth over 300 in the area. If you remember back to Mark 6, remember Jesus feeds the 5,000? Remember, it's 5,000 men, right? But with women and children, it's probably 15 or, or 20,000 people. And he tells the disciples, hey, you guys feed them. You guys figure it out. But what do they say? They say, Jesus, well, we could feed these people. We need like 200 denarii to feed these thousands and thousands of people, right? Well, this is worth 300 denarii. And people back then worked six days a week, right? A denarii was about the average day's wage. So this bottle is worth a year's average salary. So like today, that's something what, like $30,000. I don't know what the average salary is today, but I guess somewhere around um, $30,000. So Mary literally takes the equivalent of $30,000 worth of perfume and she dumps it out all on Jesus in about a minute. And now listen, if you're like me, like I said earlier, and if you're like a disciple sitting around there watching it, your first thought there is, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> what a waste. Mary, why are you dumping that out? And that's what they all thought. In verse 5, they, they stole her. And the Greek is a very strong word. They were mad. They were indignant. This money, Mary, could have been given to the poor kids in Africa. Their star. What are you doing, Mary? Right? But Jesus comes to her defense. He, he silences them and says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. And then, if you're really paying attention, the next thing that he says is, is absolutely crazy. Right? He says, For you always have the poor with you, and whatever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Listen, that's potentially crazy. Can you imagine if, like what if the church one day you guys decided that you really liked me, and you decided to give me like a $30,000 watch. Here, Pastor, here's, here's this, this $30,000 watch that we want you to have. Right. That'd be a little bit strange. But then, obviously, someone would say, like, oh, you know, yeah, that seems a little extravagant. You know, couldn't we use this money for missions or, or to give it to the poor? Couldn't we use it better? And that actually kind of makes sense. 
But what my response to that was, no, 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 do not, do not scold them. They, they did a good thing. You will always have the poor. I won't. You won't always have me. I am totally worth this extravagant gift. Right? We would obviously think that I was terribly arrogant and terribly crazy. Don't worry about the poor. I am more important than them. I deserve this wonderful extravagant gift. But that is, in effect, what Jesus is saying. And it is absolutely crazy unless he is actually God. Right? If he is just a prophet, if he is just some nice moral teacher, then dumping $30,000 on his head is absolutely wasteful. But if he is the creator, God of the universe himself, come in the flesh to save sinners, then it is a perfectly appropriate response to his value. What has Mary done? She is maybe the first person in the entire Gospel of Mark to recognize the infinite value of Christ. If He is God, and if He has actually come to do what He says He has, then no offering to Him is wasteful. No gift is too big. She recognizes the extravagance of what she, of what He has come to do for her, so she rightly wants to respond with some small piece of extravagance on her own part. And as I was studying this, it kept bringing me back to the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. We, we get the parable wrong, right? First of all, we don't think the word prodigal means, oh, it means like, oh, he's so sinful and rebellious, that terrible prodigal son. That's not at all what the word means, right? The word prodigal actually means um, recklessly extravagant, right? Prodigal means lavishly abundant. Uh, to be prodigal is just to spend everything that you have. It's the opposite of, of how I am with, with money. Prodigal is just recklessly generous and extravagant. Right? The point of that parable is not that the son is prodigal. The point of the parable is that the father is prodigal. Right? The whole point of the story is that our God is a prodigal God. And I'm stealing this from a pastor down the street. Right? It, it, it's about him. He's the prodigal one. He is the extravagant, wasteful one. It's not about the son. It's about the father. Remember, the father just gives the son everything he asks for. Here, here's half of everything that I own. And once the son has wasted it, he still welcomes him back with open arms and lavishes more um, grace and goodness and gifts on him and brings him back into the family, adds him back to the inheritance. Our God is a prodigal God. He is recklessly extravagant with us. Right? A few verses for you. 2 Corinthians 8, um, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Again, this is not the prosperity gospel. We're not talking about money and cars and watches. We're talking about spiritual riches. We're talking about grace and goodness and mercy and favor. Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all? Things. God is recklessly extravagant with His grace. And this is the heart of Christianity. And this is what Mary understands. Every other religion tells you how to work and how to earn your way to God. They are telling you what you must do to earn God's favor. The gospel is the exact opposite. It is about what God has done to richly bestow His favor on you when you did not deserve it and you can do nothing to earn it. Mary recognizes the infinite value in the person and the work of Christ. He has come to love her and serve her and save her when she was unlovable, unserveable, and unsaved. But none of this, right, none of this will make any sense to you. God's extravagance or Mary's extravagance in response will make sense if you are still kind of operating under the assumptions of religion. And if you are still operating under the assumption that, you know, you know we're just generally pretty good people. Right? That's what every other religion and every other philosophy will tell you, right? A Christianity. One of the first things that really got a hold of me and started to catch me about this well, was the honesty. It was the only place that I could find that was honest with what I was feeling about my heart and about the condition of this world. It is only in Christianity that you're going to find a realistic and honest approach to sin and evil and wickedness in the world. Christianity is the only honest one because it just flat out says we're not good people. Paul says in Romans 3, none of us are good, none of us are righteous, none of us understand, none of us seek after God. And that is really bad news. 
Paul makes it painfully clear that none of us are good enough to impress God or earn His favor or get to Him on our own power. Which that is what religion is trying to tell you to do. But that's where the good news comes in. The gospel says that God gives us His favor even when we do not deserve it. That's why Jesus came. In Mark 10, 45, God is always says, I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you and to give my life as a ransom for you. And our sins or our crimes or whatever you want to call it, those things deserve punishment. Right? And the good news is that Jesus comes in and takes that punishment for us. He takes our death and He gives us His life. And Paul says in Romans 5 that He did that for us while we were weak, ungodly, sinful enemies of God. He died for His enemies. That is reckless extravagance. Thus, as God, His person is infinitely valuable. And as the Savior that we did not deserve, His work in our place is infinitely valuable. Mary sees this and all she wants to do is respond to Jesus' infinite worth. To her, $30,000 wasn't extravagant at all. It was perfectly appropriate. If anything, it wasn't nearly enough. She understands what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 13, 44, his short little parable. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. He recognizes something of extreme value, so he is willing to give up everything that he has to get it. He sacrifices great value for much greater value. We invest in what we value. When we love something, we spend on it. Mary valued Christ, so she invested heavily in Him. It wasn't a sacrifice for her, right? It was a joy. It was a delight, right? This, I wasn't planning on this being a giving sermon, but listen, it, it makes me think that when I have to convince someone and try to explain to them the merits of giving, well, it's just demonstrating to me that they're not quite understanding what Jesus has done for them and who He is, right? When we love something, right, we just want to get it. We want to spend it. We want to be with it. We want to do those things. No one is coming here now. Very good. You don't need to start dumping your perfume out on Jesus. No, she just wants to do it because she loves it and because she is so appreciative of who He is and what He has done for her. Do you recognize the infinite worth of Christ. And I just, I'm convinced and I'm desperate to, to convince some of you that, that, that many of us don't understand the value that we claim to have. Right? Jesus Christ, God Himself, come in the flesh for us. Do we recognize the infinite worth of Christ? Because if it did, it would affect how you live. Right? Value changes things. Right? 25 years ago, in 1989, there was a man down in Philly um, he, he likes flea markets. He was shopping at a flea market. And he found a painting that was pretty ugly. He didn't really like it. But he really loved the frame around the painting. So he spent $4 to buy the painting. He's just going to get rid of the painting and keep the frame. Uh, four bucks to fifty, right? So as he's kind of taking the painting out, he's taking down the frame apart. It, it falls apart and he, he knows he can't repair it. It wasted. His, his four bucks are down the drain. But it's in the process of messing with it that he kind of opens it up and he looks and he finds just a little sheet of paper kind of hidden slid behind the painting. And he actually opens it up and looks at it and it's, it's a declaration of independence. And he actually doesn't really think much about it. He's like, oh, there's lots of copies of these. Most of them are really late and they're not really worth anything. So he just kind of shoves it in a drawer and puts it aside. That's kind of cool. That's neat. I found something neat. And, you know, that's kind of it. But in passing, a little bit later, he kind of just randomly mentions it to a friend of his. And a friend is a big kind of history buff and a collector of things. And that guy responded completely differently than the first man responded. He, he got really excited, and he basically forced his friend to take that document and to go and get it appraised. And when he did, he discovered that it was one of the original official copies of the Declaration of Independence. We hardly have any of these left anymore. There are only two that were owned by kind of private owners, right? There's just a small, tiny little handful of them, and it was very valuable. Right? And, and once he knew that, right, he took that sheet of paper out of his sock drawer and treated all my important documents were in my sock drawer. It's going to break into my house. They're all my right just so you know. And he took it out of his sock drawer, right, and then he, he treated it completely different. He called up experts and professionals, and he got it into their hands so that they could preserve it and take care of it and protect it as it deserved to be protected. 
And he sold it just pretty shortly after that for $2.4 million. And that's a pretty good return. $4 to $2.4 million. Great value. He didn't know he had it, so he didn't treat it like anything important at all. But once he knew what it was, it completely changed his relationship to that document. He acted completely differently to it because it was worth so much. Once you recognize value, you act differently in response. When I was younger, I didn't like drama or plays at all. I, I didn't get it at all. I was like, I was a young male, and I was a silly and girl, and I don't like to say no, we're lame. I never understood the allure of Shakespeare. Like, I tried. People told me, I never read Shakespeare. I, you know, I tried it, and I just never quite um, get it. And in college, I was forced to take a drama class, right? Hey, I, I didn't want to take it at all. We had to use warm up dance in our seats every morning, and it was dreadful. And no one should be as excited about anything that early in the morning as that professor was about drama. Right? I just, I, I hate it. I hate the whole class. But I had to fulfill a requirement, so I suffered through it. I did not enjoy it. It wasn't something I liked. I was using the drama course to get my degree so that I could get a job and get money. I didn't love or care for drama, but I knew that I needed it, so I used it to get what I really cared about. Right? Drama for me was a means to an end. That end was money. It was a degree, so I could get money. But I wanted the odd end of years later, everything kind of slowly, eventually changed. Right? I, for some reason, began to love plays. Right? I started to appreciate Shakespeare. I had this complete um, collection of works over on my bookshelf next door. I started going in and watching um, shows. I got to the point where Melissa and I even bought season tickets to the theater down where we used to live. Now I love plays. Right? We can't afford to go nearly as much up here, but we still love to when we can. Now, as soon as I can get my daughter to take a dumb bottle, I'm going to dump my kids on the Lake, and we're going to go watch a show. I promise my wife. As soon we can get her out of our hands. We're going to go see a show. But I love them now, right? Do you, do you see what happened, right? I began to recognize that there was value, there was worth in these works of art, right? And so I began to love them for themselves. Right? So initially, I was using plays and drama to get what I really wanted, which was a job and then money. Now, all of a sudden, I was using my money to get plays and drama, right? I recognized the value, so I began to happily spend my time and my money on them, right? We invest time, money, energy, whatever else, we invest it on what we value. If we love something, we spend on it. And we do so not begrudgingly, but willingly and joyfully because we value whatever it is we are spending it on. You don't have to tell me to buy books, right? In fact, you should probably tell me to stop buying books. Like Melissa would appreciate. They're just piling up on my desk, right? I don't need you to encourage me to buy books because I love them and I happily spend my money on them. I value books, right? And here in our passage, we see what Mary ultimately values. And it is the person and the worth of Jesus Christ. She lavishly praises him by spending sacrificially on him. Do you value the person and the work of Jesus Christ? Does your life, does your checkbook, does your calendar demonstrate that? Or are there clearly other things that you value more? Listen, I'm going to be completely honest and blunt with you. If you invest an hour and a half a week on Jesus Christ and you throw a few bucks into the offering plate, I have a hard time really believing that you actually value Jesus. Right? You know, if he's really who he is and did what he said he did, look, he's worth a whole lot more than an hour and a half of, of your week. Right? If you really believe what our scripture reading this morning says about him, right, that he is God, that he is the creator of everything, including you, that he sustains everything, including you, that everything was created for his glory, including you, and that through his death on the cross, he saved you from eternity of suffering, even though you were evil and his enemy, that should change you. Right? That should affect how you spend your time and your money. That should affect what you think about and what you pursue and what you enjoy. Whatever it is that you consider to be the most valuable thing in your life, I guarantee you, Christ is infinitely more valuable. And I'm afraid that some of us don't even know it. Mary saw the value, and she responded accordingly. She dumped everything that she had on him and didn't think 
twice about it. It was her appropriate response of worship to who he was and what he was about to do for her. But there's another character in our story, right? She responded correctly. Judas obviously did not. In John 12, Judas is the one who kind of leads the charge against Mary. He, he's the one that kind of raises the complaint. Hey, you know, what about the poor starving people? Um, and John tells us his real motive behind his protest. In John 12, 6, it writes, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. That is a really important addition to our conversation about value. Now it is clear what Judas really values. Money. He doesn't actually care about the poor. He realizes that if they sell this expensive perfume, that year's worth of money, that $30,000, goes into his bag, and he now has access to that money. Mary values Jesus. Judas values money. And he values it so much that Matthew tells us that he agrees to betray Jesus for a measly 30 pieces of silver. Right? The, the, the relatively small amount of money was more valuable to him than the Creator and Savior, Jesus. Proving true Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 34, that you cannot serve God and money. You cannot ultimately value multiple things. Everyone has one thing that is of supreme importance to them. And for Judas, it was money. He valued Jesus so little that he was willing to trade him for a small amount of what he most valued. And listen, Judas, we've got to look at Judas correctly here. Judas should be a warning to all of us. Right? Judas is the great betrayer. Right? He justly gets a very bad rap. You, you don't find the name Judas kind of leading the, the top of the most popular boys' names list. Right? No one I've ever met. Uh, Jesus, um, you know, so we think of him as the greatest villain in history. Right? Oh, he's, he's the worst. He's, he's so much worse than me. I, I could never have done what Judas did. Right? But once that's kind of your, your mindset, once that's what you're thinking, you're, you're in a bit of danger. Right? You're, you're missing the point. We are all more than capable of doing what Judas did, and we prove it every day. Every time you know what you should do, every time you weigh your options, you, you consider what God would want you to do, knowing that your sin would require the death of Jesus, and then you still choose to sin anyways, you betray Jesus. And we are all Judas. We are all guilty of his sin to some degree. And think about it. If he doesn't really kind of make you pause and think for a second, you're not paying attention. We should all examine our hearts and our motives in light of Judas. If even he can turn out to be a fake, then, then none of us should feel too um, good about ourselves. Judas was an intimate friend of Jesus. Right? Judas lived and he traveled with Jesus for three years. He was taught, he sat at the very feet of Jesus and was taught by wisdom personified. He ate with Jesus. He went out in Jesus' name and preached and did miracles in Jesus' name. He knew Jesus more intimately than anyone um, besides maybe Peter, James, and John. Judas shows us that proximity to Jesus, the knowledge of Jesus, is not a guarantee of relationship with Jesus. Just coming to church regularly, just reading your Bible sometimes and saying that you know Jesus is no guarantee that you actually do. Knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus are eternally different things. Right? Saying you believe in Jesus and truly loving, valuing, and following Him are completely different things. Do you really value Jesus? Or do you value something more than Him? Are you Mary or are you Judas? And you always wonder and ask, you know, why? Why, why, did, Judas, why did Judas do it? Why did he betray his close friend after three years um, with him? And ultimately, we don't know. The Bible never specifically tells us um, why he did it. But I think it's probably related to what we've been talking about. I think it's related to his values. But remember, the disciples were constantly arguing about 
greatness. Remember, initially, they wrongly assumed, like everyone else, that Jesus was coming in, he was going to vanquish the Romans, he's going to have a big white horse, he's going to wipe them out, he's going to reestablish the brand new glorious kingdom of Israel. And the disciples were going to be his right hand, and men kind of leading and ruling alongside of him. But then Jesus just he won't stop. He keeps talking about taking up crosses. And he talks about serving others. And he's talking about suffering. And then he keeps saying something about dying. Right? That, that's, that's probably not exactly what Judas signed up for. Now, we already know that he was a thief and that he loved money. Right? So it probably is not too big of a leap to assume that he also loved glory and power. He, he loved those things that would come with him in a position of authority in the grand, glorious kingdom of Israel. And when he realized that Jesus wasn't about those things, that Jesus wasn't coming to do that, he betrayed him. He simply chose what he valued more. And he probably recognized that Jesus was going to be killed either way. Right? The signs were there. He, he's saying it's going to happen. So, hey, you know, might as well make a little bit of money off of the transaction while we're at it. Right? He so valued money and he sought what he valued. But again, I, I, I want you to consider Judas. Because we always think of him as this like terrible villain. Like he's he's red, he probably has horns and a tail, he carries a pitchfork, he's always walking around snarling and angry. He's mad, evil Jesus or Judas. And he's this terrible, terrible guy. But listen, Judas was the most trustworthy of the disciples, right? Judas was given the money. Judas was given the map. He was given charge of everything that they had, right? You don't do that to just kind of some guy that you don't trust, right? You give it to the guy who you're good at having the money, right? Judas was a trustworthy man that they all um, believed in. Like the Pharisees, Judas would have been very well kept and well dressed. He would have been uh, very religious and kept all the rules. He would have been very moral and just a good God. A Judas would have been the kind of guy that we would love to have in church today. Right? He just looks good. He keeps all the rules. He's got all his money and he takes care of it. You know, we would love to have a guy like Judas in the church. But think about it. It wasn't. It wasn't the sketchy sinners and, and the prostitutes and, and all these terrible people that we just are uncomfortable with. It wasn't those people who arrested and killed Jesus. It was the moral religious guys and it was one of his closest Friends. Why? Because of what they valued. Right? The Pharisees so valued their appearance. They so valued their, their goodness, their, their rule keeping. They so valued having the, the, the control to save themselves by following the rules. That when Jesus showed up and told them that they were just as lost as the prostitutes were, whether they could handle but they couldn't deal with the parable of the prodigal son, which said, oh, by the way, the older brother is just as lost as the younger brother. The older brother needs my salvation just as much as the younger brother, right? They couldn't handle it, so they killed him. <laughs> don't be like Judas, and don't be like the Pharisees. Listen, I, I'm, I'm just burdened, and I, I care, I'm so concerned that, that some of us are not valuing the things that we should be valuing. Like, like, like Judas, or we, we value whatever it is, money, work, leisure, uh, family, whatever, all these good things, that we, but we end up ultimately valuing them over Christ. Right? It, Jesus it is so much more valuable than any of these things. And valuing anything, no matter how good it is, over Him is eternally dangerous. What do you most value? Is it Jesus Christ? And if it is, my, my question to you is simply, my statement is to prove it. Right? That, that's what James says in James chapter 2. He says, show me. Right? He says, I will show you my faith by my works. If you value something, it changes you. Right? You love it. You think about it. You pursue it. You spend time and money and resources on it. Do you value Jesus like Mary does? Because again, my fear is that so many of us do not recognize the infinite value that is just staring us in the face. John Newton, who wrote um, The Writer of Amazing Grace, and listen, this guy truly was a wretch. He was a slave trader. He was just a terrible, terrible man um, that was saved uh, by the amazing grace of God. I've been reading some of his letters this week, and he wrote this in one of them. It says, he writes, How much to be pitied who, while they make profession of the gospel, seem to have no idea 
of the effects it is designed to produce upon the hearts of believers. Have you been changed by the gospel? Have you really experienced the beauty and the value of Christ? Well, we talked about it last week. Four times Jesus says, wake up, stay awake, be ready, be on guard, spiritually be prepared because this stuff matters. Guys, listen, if all of this stuff is true in the Bible that Jesus says, then there's nothing else that matters in comparison. If it's not true, we're all wasting our time and we shouldn't pay any attention. Right? The one thing that it can't be is, is kind of true or kind of of medium importance. He's either the most important thing in the world or he's nothing. And don't waste your time with him. And if he is the most important thing in the world, that should fundamentally alter how you live. Right? That should change everything. Right? Do we love him? Right? Because I, I, I'm here telling you and pleading with you that he is worth it. Right? He, is, he is worth, I, I guarantee to you, whatever it is that you have to sacrifice to have him. He is the very life itself. And I so desperately want all of us to see him as he truly is. And that is infinitely valuable and infinitely worth whatever it is that he of us. Let's, let's go to him and close in a word. Father, uh, I come uh, confessing uh, my um, sin and my tendency um, sometimes, Father, to treat uh, your grace and your Son um, so, so flippantly, uh, Lord, how I am so prone to, to care about um, things that ultimately do not matter, uh, Lord. And so I, I pray right now that you would work in my heart through your word, Father, and just show me the infinite value of Christ um, that we see Mary recognizing here in this passage. Father, I pray that you drive us to Colossians 1, where we see Jesus Christ as, as the creator of everything. Everything that exists was created by him and for him. Everything that exists sustains and is held together by his power. Everything that exists was created for his glory. And it is that person who came down and gave his life for sinners, uh, for enemies, for weak, ungodly uh, people like me, um, Lord. I just pray that you would help me understand that. Help all of us to understand the infinite value of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross in our place. Father, I pray that you would just pour your love and your grace into our hearts and motivate us, Father, to live in light of who Jesus Christ is. Father, I pray that you would make us into Mary. Father, help us to understand what she has understood and that we would live our life uh, to, to just to return and to, to come back to you and thanks for what you have done for us and to do that in large part by turning and loving others, by, by trying to, to convince them also of the worth of Jesus Christ and of their need um, for him. Um, Lord, I pray that we would be a place that really values um, Jesus. It's in his name.